Hey, and welcome back to the podcast. Leah Wheatholder is here from WorkmanForensics.com. And Leah is the CEO and founder of Workman Forensics in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she is formerly from the FBI, the good old Federal Bureau of Investigation. And she has something called the Data Sleuth Process, which is a scalable data-first approach to forensic accounting engagements and fraud investigations. She has an excellent podcast called the Data Sleuth Podcast, which is bi-weekly. And she discusses all things investigation with other industry experts. So that sounds like a lot of fun. We'll find out what it's all about, what Leah does, what makes her unique and stand out. So glad to be speaking with you, Leah. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Glad to have you. And so we gave a little bit of an introduction about you, but what's your current focus and passion? What has you super excited lately? Yeah, um, you kind of summed it up, but in more detail, just our data sleuth process and working cases that um, maybe typically our clients or uh, as part of the trainings that I provide, someone has found an issue within their business or within the company they work for. And they know that they have a problem. They know that they have missing money and then they want to know what to do next. And so the next step, you know, we're always looking to see if we can recover any of those funds. But a lot of times they're looking to see, can this case be prosecuted? Do I have a case in civil court? And so we help them take the flags that they found and turn that into, you know, show them how to work the entire investigation from start to finish and then wrap up with a result that hopefully does one of those three things, if not all three things, you know, recover some of that loss, maybe file criminal charges and have a prosecutor interested in prosecuting that case or um, filing a civil suit where they can try to recover those damages that way. Wonderful. That sounds very logical and helpful. And this is such a needed skill these days, isn't it? Because we have more data and more storage and more computing power than ever before. And we need to make sense of that in so many different ways, right? Like, well, I have the the, the power of Google or chat GPT at my fingertips, but what use is that unless I use that to solve a problem or get some kind of result? And so you say that you you jump into these businesses and like figure out like where the, the missing money is gone. And would you say like, is there a percentage of like times when it's innocently gone or when it's kind of maliciously gone? Is there like a pie chart there? So my, it, looking at the cases that I'm hired to work, it's gonna be very skewed data. So uh, I would say probably 5% of the cases that were hired to work, they're going to be mistakes and or there's just not great evidence to prove what happened. Um, sometimes there, and this is a little nitty gritty, but sometimes a company doesn't have good internal controls. And whenever they don't have great internal controls, then that means they're going to lack internal evidence that would actually prove that someone stole money. So in a lot of those cases, it ends up just being an administrative thing. Maybe they let the person go because they don't trust them anymore, but there's really no avenue to recover because there's not great evidence to support whether you know this was intentional or not. Um, because the difference between a mistake and fraud is intent. So someone might benefit from their actions and maybe it was a mistake. One that comes to mind is when um, someone was entering their own expense reimbursements and the decimal got moved to place. So it might be a hundred dollar reimbursement, but they were being reimbursed for a thousand dollars. So that decimal moved, you know, one, one place over. Um, so in that case, there wasn't great evidence to prove like, yes, this person benefited $900 more than they should have, but there's still an element of fraud that has to be proven, which is that intentional piece. And um, in order to prove that this company didn't have good internal controls that would have shown that this person like, you know, um, somehow tried to hide it. It was very visible throughout the entire process. So in that case, they weren't able to file any charges, although they were able to work with the employee and ask this employee to pay them back. So they were able to recover that way. Um, but as far as proving that it was embezzlement or fraud, that wasn't possible. So that's kind of where that line is. Um, you know, yes, they might have benefited, but was it intentional? And so the way that we approach our cases through the data sleuth process is factoring in both types of evidence. Do we have internal evidence or external evidence that will show that intentional piece? Now, I can't 
as an expert, I can't testify as to somebody's intent, but I can at least show this is evidence, uh, like a payment to somebody. Uh, one comes to mind, this lady was overpaying herself in payroll. She was paying herself twice. Well, one of the paychecks would show up in QuickBooks in their financial statements. The other one, she would issue it and then she would delete it. Well, we could see the deletion in the audit logs. So that proved, you know, that provided really great evidence of intentional. She intended to hide those additional payroll checks. Okay. And that's helpful to, to think about just with those, those two stories there, just like the idea of you look at all this evidence and you figure out what the intent was. Could it have been an honest mistake or did they do the the extra Watergate sort of steps of like covering up the original, you know, crime or, or, or offense or whatever? And then you say, well, now we're looking at this whole picture there. It tells a more of a story. And so what's, what's great about kind of hearing about your thought process and some of your adventures here is that anything that we do, right, any kind of like industry we're in, service we provide, there's always some some room for excitement, right? There's always those fun stories like you're telling just to make it like really like engaging and, and with the good messaging and marketable. And it's always really uh, easy to default to the boring dry stuff that everyone assumes. So that, that's really cool to hear about and think about. And so what surprised you in all of, I mean, I, I know you jump into all these different kind of situations, but is there anything that surprised you about like your own process or your own like mistakes and failures? Is there anything that just kind of like made you change your way of thinking in your journey here? Yes. Um, and this is a story that I have actually started telling a little more recently. Uh, we had a case where this guy suspected that his controller was stealing money. And so he hired us to look at it. Uh, his girlfriend at the time was really pushing him to do this. And she was very involved in these initial conversations. My client was going through uh, the business owner. He was going through just a whole lot. He had, a, he was running this big business and then his father was on hospice. He had some other personal things going on. And then, so this girlfriend is just like really like driving this case. So I just told the guy, I, you know, he had a lot going on and I said, let's just look at the most recent year. Typically when people are stealing money, it a lot of times it actually starts as a mistake that, that a lot of times or they realize oh i can pay this one bill that i can't pay on my own i can pay it and then i'll just pay it back out of payroll you know it just starts really really small and then the longer that it goes undetected which in my experience is on average is about five years the association of certified fraud examiners says 18 months the ones i'm hired for these people have been stealing money three to five years at minimum um, but the longer that that case, that that theft is going on, the greater the loss. So, um, I said, let's look at the most recent year because that should show us if this controller is stealing money. He says, that sounds great. And, um, so I start working the case. I'm not really, I I'm following our process. Uh, we, we had certain parts of the data sleuth process at that time. And so I'm working that, uh, analysis. And I just told him, I said, I'm really not seeing anything. Uh, you know, I, I'd be happy to come in and talk to her about a few things, but it's just not a big dollar amount. I mean, we were talking maybe, maybe $5,000 and this is a very large company. So very insignificant. And he said, yeah, just come in and talk to her. So we're sitting there. She's very mad that he even suspected her, of course. So we kind of overcome that. And I said, well, let me ask you about a few of these transactions. And one of them was the purchase of some golf clubs for like $3,500, and she looks at this owner, business owner and says, you know about these. You know about these. I asked you if I could buy these on the corporate credit card. You said yes. And you told me I could pay it out of payroll. I was like, okay, great. Do you have payroll records to show this? And she said, yes. And she printed off the spreadsheet right then. You know, she'd been paying it back. It was all good. And he's, he said, oh yeah, you're right. I did tell you you could do that. So we get through this interview and I, I just tell him, I said, I can keep going back and we can look more. Um, or I can just wrap this up, write a report, you know, and move on. And he said, just, just, let's just close it out. I've got too many things going on. Let's close it out. So we close out the case. I write the report and, um, several other things happen, but basically the point of the story is that, uh, the girlfriend then gives me a one-star Google review and I am like, what, you know? And so I'm having to learn how to respond to this one-star Google review, it's, uh, I, I mean, I've been in business probably eight years at the time. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me out of all these cases I've worked. But what it did was, you know, I responded to Google review and it's still out there. Um, but essentially 
I think that the girlfriend thought that there were issues with the controller and the business owner. And so it was very fueled and motivated by this girlfriend. But because of our process, we're looking at the facts. We're not looking at the story anybody's telling us. We're looking at the data. And if the data didn't support it, then you know, I'm not going to make a re the recommendation that someone get fired over a story. Instead, I'm going to tell them what the facts show. So that part of the process was working great. We could show the facts. And I felt really good about this controller not being wrongfully accused of doing something she didn't do. So I felt really great about that. But then I end up with this one-star review. What do I do? So what I realized was that the part of our process that was really lacking was create we had a plan internally but we weren't communicating that to the client we weren't getting their participation in what this investigation was actually being set up to do and so we started creating what is now called our case planning process and the case planning process now works as a tool to educate my team like they get to learn about cases learn when to apply different analyses we do it in a workshop format but then also we get the client's agreement on this very simple, it could be very complicated in my world, but we've made it a very simple, they can look at this chart and say, yeah, this, these are my problems and these are the priorities and they can sign off on it. And so while that was horribly embarrassing to go through that process, and I still don't even enjoy telling the story, but to go through getting this one-star review, um, it improved our process and really made it where now we have a very robust process that starts off with great client communication, um, you know, just starting the engagement that way, still performing our great analysis, but then also being able to communicate at the end, here's how we've addressed everything that we said we were going to address the case planning step. I like that. That's helpful just to, to hear about that process of like kind of navigating that nuance of there's the logical side of things and the emotional, right? And with the, the if you ignore the emotional, then you might just be really cold and miss out on that kind of personality and the that little bit of hand holding, and you might miss out on some of the creativity. But then on the flip side, if you let your emotions drive the train, then you'll be all over the place and unpredictable when it comes time to be logical and rational and stick to the facts and make decisions and that won't work. So it, it's helpful to hear about how you're saying, well, we need to, uh, you know, figure out our process and make it better, especially when bad things happen, we can turn it into a good thing, right? This one star review, couldn't avoid it, can't really do much about it other than respond to it. So then how do we turn it into a positive, refine our process and make things a little bit better next time, knowing that if the one star review hadn't happened, you might've thought like, well, why should I waste my time on this? Or am I making this overly complicated? And then also it's cool how you mentioned in there that it's all around simplicity, right? You're adding in this extra, here's this chart, here's the signing off on it, but just to keep things just on track and making them simple. And it's also cool just to hear about some of the, like the best practices, the statistics, right? Like when like I could never be in in law enforcement. It seems really complicated. But when the when the police say things like, "Well, crimes are usually done like this," or like burglars are like that, somehow that's fascinating, right? And even like you mentioned, how this whole stealing from work thing happens maybe innocently enough or small enough or just this one time only. But then when there's no consequences or maybe there's like a little bit of like a, like a thrill involved or, or it's easy money or who knows what it is, but then it just becomes this kind of downhill snowball picking up speed. And next thing you know, three to five years later, now it got noticed. That's where you get called in. So it's kind of just cool to hear about the uh, just the the world that that is. And so you mentioned a few times that there's this data sleuth process, and that sounds interesting and exciting. So is there a, a quick way to explain that in these last few minutes of our conversation? Sure. Yeah. So the data sleuth process really starts with, you know, just even the client intake, understanding the emotional component, like you mentioned, we call it like listening to the drama and identifying the concerns and identifying the things that we as forensic accountants can actually address because there's a lot of it that we can't. And then distilling that down into a case plan. What are the concerns of the client and how can we address that with our analysis? And then based on the analysis we're going to perform, that will tell us what data we need to look at. So part of the process is about how do we take um, different financial data and make sense of it. And there's several different analyses that I outline in the book. And then taking that information and communicating it in a way where law enforcement can understand it, a judge, jury, the client can understand it, 
uh, and even we work with a lot of attorneys. So where the attorney can understand it as well. And um, I think that the re like really the secret sauce of this uh, analysis and this entire process is that case planning component because we've created a framework. We've created a framework to help us take a problem that seems very, very large and make it and, and break it down into bite-sized pieces where we can perform analysis, know exactly what it's going to, we, we don't necessarily know the results of the analysis, but we know that that analysis is going to tell us what exactly happened. So then we can communicate the story and it'll be based on facts. We can be objective. And then if we do as part of these engagements, a lot of times I have to testify in court. So then I can know that I'm testifying to things, again, from an objective third party perspective. Um, and a term in the expert witness world is that you don't want to be a hired gun. And so this process helps investigators um, stand outside of the drama to produce those types of findings and reports. Wonderful. And I especially like the part about how you're writing things so that these different types can understand it, right? The the client can, the the court can, the jury can. And so and that seems to take, I'm, I'm assuming, a lot of kind of revising and refining, right? Of like saying what you want to say, but also making it simple, but not oversimplified. And you mentioned this whole thing about the um, like being the expert witness. And all I know about that is just from like seeing on TV. And so is that like nervous? wracking do you have to prepare a lot like what's the whole expert witness thing like yeah um it's definitely it can be nerve-wracking especially when we first started out um i've really refined even that portion of the process where i can even advise attorneys like hey this is how i can help you in the best way this is the best way that we can communicate this information because so much of it is i mean so much of my testimony is going to be based on financial information and um, actually, a few weeks ago, I was testifying and in a hearing. So it was a smaller setting. And the judge yawned next to me. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I like to think that I'm interesting, but still, there's just this component of financial you know, accounting that I'm having to explain. And so I kind of looked at the judge when he yawned and he apologized. And it was a you know, kind of a funny moment. But to, to figure out how can I articulate what I did? what I found, make it interesting to the extent that you can. I mean, it's still court. It's still a very serious, formal process, but, and there's just certain things that attorneys have to get into the record that are not going to be interesting, but then to be able to communicate that in a way, um, for example, in this case, I was having to describe a lot about accounting, but then I showed tables comparing different sources of information. And I just created a picture with a table showing how none of these sources of information matched. And in this case, that was extremely critical to my client's outcome. And it was very compelling. And then the case actually settled. So um, to, to be able to communicate that information, but that's taken, I mean, I've been doing this work since 2006. And um, so it's taken quite a bit. Now I only testify on about 10% of my cases, um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting aspect to, to this work. And it just shows the how important it is to beef up those communication skills and keep them in practice. Because if you don't, if you're not a very good communicator, or you don't do it very often, it can be just really nerve wracking. It can be the most terrifying experience of your life. But if it's something that you do regularly, you can have fun with it. And it seems like you can up your game, right? And having the tables or the visual aids, and you think about the scenes and movies like for some reason like the big short comes to mind if you remember that one where like he's stacking yeah. like jenga blocks and explaining like the financial stuff and i'm like oh this is he's like throwing them in the garbage and i don't even remember it exactly but like it was so much fun just to to watch the, these kind of dull ideas come alive in a fun way and then there's that element that you mentioned there of like being a little bit dynamic like for sure it's like a serious situation but if someone's doing something a little distracting like the judge is yawning well what do you do do you try to ignore it do you let it like bother you and now your mind's kind of, you know, the gears are turning or do you kind of just like react to it a, a, a slight bit or make a joke about it and then you move on and kind of be uh, serious enough, but not take yourself so seriously that you miss the mark or you stress yourself out or any of those sorts of things. And so how does somebody know if 
their company is a good fit for this amazing service you provide? Are they, do they need to be in a certain industry, certain size, have a certain problem? How do they know if they're the right fit for you? If you think that you're missing money, either maybe through a controller, CFO, um, the number one thing that I hear is something's wrong with my cash. I'm selling a lot. Nothing's changed in our expenses yet. I don't have any cash. Um, that's the number one complaint from business owners. So, um, so those, it, it, so the industry doesn't matter. That could be anyone. If you're experiencing cash flow issues and you're suspicious that there might be an issue within your company, someone taking more than they're entitled to, that is a great fit. Um, also in more like larger companies, publicly traded companies, if you suspect any type of kickbacks or collusion between vendors, that seems to be the most common thing in our larger companies that have more robust internal controls is that they'll have um, issues with vendors, shell companies, you know, fake companies being paid, things like that, or kickbacks. So we can also help in that capacity as well. Excellent. So if you have those suspicions, then let Leah Wheatholter and her team dig into that. Look at that. The website is workmenforensics.com. And then it's the Data Sleuth podcast. Are those some logical next steps or how does someone reach out, contact you, take the next step? Yeah, everything is on our website. You can request a complimentary consultation, um, find the podcast, find other resources, blogs, trainings. It's all linked on workmenforensics.com. I love it. And as we're going to workmanforensics.com, do you have any final parting words of advice, Leah? Because sometimes it helps to think of like a, a lesson or helpful tip. It seems like you really have this whole like focus dialed in, you're passionate about your work, you refine your process. So what do you have to tell us just about a final quote or lesson to really send us on our way? Sure. Um, I think that there's a couple different ways to take this, but what I what I would say is if you do suspect that someone is stealing money in your business, and especially if you are the owner, a lot of times these owners don't actually have access to their own financial information, and they can feel intimidated to go get that financial information to just take a look. You don't have to even let the person know, but if you own this business, you are entitled to that information and you are entitled to just look. Um with, and you don't have to start firing people or anything. It doesn't have to be dramatic, but you should know what's going on in your company. And that never hurts. That is very helpful. You are entitled to just look. And let's think about that as we go to workmanforensics.com. And thank you very much, Leah, for showing up, giving us some amazing stories and advice. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks so much for having me.